Hi, I'm Deepak Bhatt, reporting for ACC.org from Barcelona at the European Society of Cardiology. We're here at the final day, and I'm so lucky to be joined by Professor Gabriel Steg, my good friend and colleague from Paris. Welcome. Thank you. Maybe we could start off with a discussion of the PURE study, not a trial, but a really important observational analysis. Yes, a fantastic analysis, a large-scale international epidemiological study conducted by the PHR Institute and Salim Youssouf in Canada. But they did that study across 18 countries in the world for several years <coughs> in more than 113,000 patients. Right. And what they did is correlate nutrition questionnaire, uh, uh, food questionnaires, to outcomes, both for all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and cardiovascular disease. And what they are presenting is really a shocker. <laughs> it uh, is. They're showing, first of all, that to make it short, fat doesn't harm you. In fact, there was a lower mortality in patients who had a, a nutrition and a, a diet rich in fat. Sugar harms you, and mortality seemed higher in patients who had greater intake of, of sugars. Right. which is not totally surprising. The interesting finding is that it was not driven by cardiovascular mortality. <laughs> so I know there's a whole story developing out there that sugar is what causes heart attacks. Well, this does not support this. Sugar is bad for you, it gives you diabetes, it can kill you, but not through heart disease. <laughs> so there was a, an interesting editorial alongside the paper that, that summarizes the finding of Pure in the Lancet, and it's essentially making the point that we need to eat humble pie, right. because as doctors, we don't really know a lot about nutrition, and we need more interventional trials. You're absolutely right. I think this trial or uh, study is going to get a huge amount of media coverage, so I, I think it's really important for our audience to be familiar with it. Your patients are going to ask you about aspects. They may not know it's a pure study, but they'll hear aspects about it, and there's just so much confusion out there about what the right diet is, but I think there's a lot of insight from this study, and it does show that a high-carb diet, very bad for you. See, Of course, when you go on a low-fat diet, that often ends up being a high-carb diet. If that happens, you know, that can be a disaster. So, uh, of course, it matters what you eat, and, you know, substituting one bad thing with another bad thing uh, can backfire. The other interesting thing from this as well, it wasn't just the whole story about uh, high-carb diet being bad. Uh, also, the servings of fruits and vegetables and legumes, it seemed that about three to four was the sweet spot. So if you can get three to four servings of veggies and, and, and fruits and legumes, that, that probably is sufficient for optimizing uh, the mortality reduction. More was a little bit better, but really that seemed to be the optimal spot. So really good stuff from Pure. Uh, the next study we're going to mention, not a trial either, was an analysis from the MOD database, uh, CFDA uh, uh, safety database that uh, examined uh, TAVR valves and showed some thrombosis there. I was involved with it. You know, caveat that there's no denominator per se. We just have a numerator showing some uh, thromboses in TAVR. But do you think this is a real issue, these TAVR uh, thromboses? Of course, with 4D CT, you can, you can find it if you look for it. But so that's the problem important? is what does it mean and what should we do about it? And I think until we have the results of the interventional trials that are testing antithrombotic interventions in this population, we won't really know for sure whether we should put these patients on more intensive antithrombotic therapy, including anticoagulants, right. to prevent this or not, and what we should do it what we should do with this when we, once we find it. But it suddenly is worrying that we're seeing this. And interestingly enough, we're not seeing this only in TAVR valves. We're also yes. seeing this in bioprosthetic surgical valves. Good point. Right, it's not just the TAVR valves. So uh, let's move on to now a totally different therapeutic area of high blood pressure and its treatment and J-curves and pulse pressure. And, uh, there was some really great data from the Clarify Registry, which you lead, that were presented here. Previously from the Clarify Registry, as published in Lancet, there was clear evidence of a J-curve. But what did this analysis here do to build upon that prior observation? Yeah, so I think it's really important to point out that the J-curve is the observation that we're seeing increased cardiovascular mortality mortality and increased event rates in patients with coronary artery disease who achieve very low diastolic blood pressure. Uh, that was the observation we reported last year. Now a lot of discussion was, was this related to pulse pressure, was this related to arterial stiffness? Right. And we did further analysis of this large database, Clarify is a registry of more than 30,000 patients with established coronary artery disease. And what we found is that when we cross-classify diastolic blood pressure or systolic blood pressure as a function of pulse pressure, the effect of the J-curve is still there. Mm -hmm. So it's not driven by arterial stiffness. It's truly the low diastolic blood pressure that seems to be harmful. Again, 
in patients with established coronary artery disease. And this is consistent with other observations from, from other data sets. And I think it's a word of caution about lowering too much diastolic blood pressure in patients with established CAD. I don't think it necessarily contradicts observation from sure. the SPRINT trial and other trials that we should be more aggressive in intensive treatment of hypertension. Yeah, yeah. I think it all matters what the comorbidities are. It, it, it really is a lot of finesse managing blood pressure, and I think most docs uh, believe there is a J-curve. Uh, let's just say a word about the REVEAL trial that examined uh, compound anisotropib that raises HDL, also lowers LDL a bit, uh, studied in a large uh, outcome trial uh, that was also positive, a significant reduction in ischemic events, uh, uh, non-fatal ischemic events, but still a positive trial. Yeah, that was a surprise too, because this is the fourth trial with a CTP inhibitor. The first one with trocetropib was halted prematurely for increased mortality, but we know that there were probably off-target effects from that molecule. Then there were two negative trials with right. dalcetropib and evacetropib. And uh, then the fourth trial suddenly becomes positive. Now the question, is it related to the HDL raising effect of CTP inhibitors? May, is it related to the LDL lowering effect of that molecule, yes. and what's the clinical significance of this reduction, which is modest and not associated with a mortality or cardiovascular mortality reduction, and what's the safety of this intervention long term, remembering that this compound is a compound that stays almost forever in the body once you, you take it. You, the half-life, the biological half-life of anacetapib is very long. So I think this is a concern that we'll have to keep in mind. Sure, but interesting data conceptually, again, you know, it looks like uh, we can lower ischemic risk uh, even further and, than And the hypothesis was not wrong. That's correct. So the yeah. CTP so, hypothesis in the end was proven to be right. Absolutely. The final study I just wanted to touch upon was uh, one from a registry, the Sweetheart Registry again, uh, looking at uh, MI outcomes, uh, showing dramatic improvements, event rates going down, though a bit of a plateauing, I think, around 2008 or so. So a lot of progress. But you've done similar work as well, I believe, from the French registry known as FASTMI. Yes, my colleague Nicolas Donchin has been leading this uh, periodic uh, registry. It's a periodic survey done every five years in France called FASTMI. MI, and what he's found and reported is that he's seeing the exact same thing as the sweetheart group. Right. We've seen this incredible progress in post-ACS outcomes and acute ACS outcomes over the past 25 years, but now we're seeing a plateau. And I think that further improvements will come from exploring other avenues that when we've done in the past, we can't continue to pile up antithrombotic therapy sure. or do PCI and expect to reduce mortality. And even if we do faster PCI, we have evidence from other sources that also we've maxed out on reducing delays. So we have to look at shark, treatment of shark, yes. treatment of CTOs, treatment of multivessel disease, as well as treatment of the underlying disease with the new avenues that have been pointed out at this meeting with Cantus, inflammation, um, uh, compass, combining anticoagulation, low right. dose with antiplatelet therapy, et cetera. Yeah, you know, when you put it that way, it's really an exciting time in cardiovascular medicine. Lots of advances, I think lots of potential future avenues for research, lots of trials presented here that I think will change clinical practice. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's been a fantastic meeting here. Uh, the ESC has been very welcoming. Barcelona has been a lovely city, uh, really very kind to all of us coming in from out of town. Hopefully you back home have enjoyed our recap of what's going on here.